yellow and with the blue for my graining, my under directional blend that I want to do to establish large veins. Um, I'm going to just use my two house brushes. You guys can use your, you know, three inch. And I'm just going to land this down. When I'm doing this, I want to vary the, the width or the line weight, you know, of kind of where I'm putting this, where I'm starting and stopping it. So I'm going to want to have ones that go all the way across the board. And I have a couple that I'm letting taper out here and there. Um, sorry, it's like wall o paint cans. Uh, so yeah, so I'm also not like making it perfectly straight, as you can see. Um, but yeah, so I want the blue to have different thicknesses. It's looking pretty similar right now. So I want to do that to widen that up. Um, so do you see how it's kind of getting vaguely? You see how I'm making vague, large, fat, you know, woodish shapes in here. So land the blue. Take my yellow. Um, the blue is going to dry faster than the yellow on you because it is a heavier body paint. It's thicker. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're putting it down. So if you're worried about it, do like half and then move past. I'm used to making myself move fast and I'm not, I'm not having to think about it as much as you guys might be because I've, I've done it before and I have, I have that experience with lens confidence um, to not having to think. So now I've got my chunks of color down. So you see how I didn't really smash them into each other too, too much. Just kind of touched them here and there. Now I'm going to come and kind of get them blending a little bit. I want it to have a little blend here and there. Um, I also am totally fine if I have a hard line here and there where the two colors meet because that will just give more variety to my work. So this is what I mean by like a hard, high contrasting line, right? Um, I'm not going to leave it like that the whole I don't think. My underpainting is also this technique too, so my holidays aren't going to hurt me. So yeah. Um, one thing you really want to watch out for and you want to avoid when you're doing pretty much any of these techniques is um, hard start and stop lines where your tool shape is visible. So like that line is ugly and bad and will not look like natural wood grain because of the big square thing. So if I just made all my stripes, the width of my tool, straight lines, left my right angle start stopped, it's not going to be as convincing of a, tech, uh, of a paint technique. Does that make sense? Cool. So I'm going to smooth that out because I'm going to work over, I'm going to work on top of this later. I'm going to build up over it. But we're not going to sit around waiting for paint to dry. Um, so you guys on your boards do that technique across both your boards. So you're going to base paint with like the city white or any kind of light value free paint. Um, anything that will take that yellow on top of it decently. When you are um, painting over your boards to clean them up and have a new fresh coat, um, one pass of white you'll still see little ghosts of the work underneath. That's fine. You do not have to do a second coat of white and make it pristine. It's okay. If you want to, because that makes your heart happy, go for it. I get that too. Some people like that and want to take the moment to do that second coat to be like perfectly clean slate, you know? I respect that. It's fine. But it is not required. You can work on top of a white with a little undulation visible and it's not going to hurt the technique that you guys are doing. So you're going to do your directional blend across both your boards. Then you're going to work in with the grain color, um, which is the raw umber, thinned out with water only. There's no glaze in here. And I'm going to show you a couple ways to do brush graining. 
So this is for grain made with brushes. You are not going to use the graining tool with this. It will not work because this is too watery. You will see why. So I have to make a couple more of these, um, but you, you see these brushes, how I have the jaggedy tooth on this one? This is just an old beat up chip brush that hasn't been rinsed properly many, many times. It's crunchy. And it's very worn down, like it's stubby. Um, it, these often get these little walrus, walrus whiskers on the edges. That will make like a mark on each side like that. Um, you can trim it off if it's giving you trouble. Um, I often try to do that. You'll see several brushes like this where they all have that kind of walrus. Um, but yeah, this is made simply by trimming out sections of the chip brush, leaving some of it longer and cutting some of it down. This one I think I forgot entirely to rinse out after I used it. It looks really stiff. But that's fine, it'll work. And the stiffness with the even bristles is actually going to be massively advantageous and it actually helps me do the technique. So in this little bin, which I will leave on the table with all the paint, um, these are the crunchy chip brushes. You can do this with a normal chip brush that is not crunched out. It just takes a lot more finesse. Um, so yeah, so those will be around and I will make a couple more of these. Um, you can always like make a custom one of these for yourselves out of chip brush because they're cheap. So if you have a very specific grain pattern you're trying to do for a designer or something, you can play around with these um, and try and find, find one that's suitable. So yeah, so using my nice washy-ish um, grain. So I want to get paint on it, but I don't want it to be like super overloaded. Um, this is going to drag really nicely for me because the glaze on here makes it a little slicker. So. Uh, if you're finding that you need, um, like if you're finding that doing this, you like run out of paint all the way through, put a little more paint on the brush before you start dragging. So you can do just a straight drag across with this. If I hold this thing the same orientation every way, it's gonna make a slight pattern for me. So that's always one thing that's nice to do is flip it around, do it different ways. Um, all in all, when you're doing this, your, your general goal should be to drag it straight, um, especially because you guys are learning. Getting a straight drag is harder than getting a drag with character. So do your best to get um, to do straight, straight grains. A little uh, wobble here and there is really nice and actually helpful. So again, softeners. So. Trying to get a generally straight grain. I'm a human. I'm not perfect. So there's enough little kick in it that's actually um, creating a natural feeling shape. Uh, I like to, so you see the really fat line? That is probably this whole chunk making contact, actually. Um, so I need to tip up a little more. When I do this kind of graining, I like to um, try and come at it and think about it kind of like an airplane landing and taking off. Uh, because again, just like we don't want in our directional blend, we don't want a lot of stuff like this. You know, like that looks like it's been made by a person in some way because it is broken got 98 degree angles cutting across it, straight lines cutting it out. Um, so that's where doing it, uh, you know, coming down, if I need to come out of it, you know, right? It's a little more subtle, right? That's a little better than the first one, right? Even better, and I come in and drag. And if, say I have to lift off somewhere around here for whatever reason, I'm going to start by actually twisting this way with my brush so that I'm actually lifting part of it this way. So I'm doing airplane and a wing tip. I don't know, what should we call that, right? A wing tilt. So that I can kind of taper out where my lines are starting and stopping. That is also a thing that will make your grain have a finesse and a believability to it 
that will make it stand out as a high, high quality technique compared to something very basic. So I like to like teach you guys how to do the best version of this stuff as much as possible. Um, so play with that kind of stuff as you're doing this. Again, the intention of it is get your hands on it, try these things, see how the techniques work. Um, another fun thing you can do with this kind of brush greening is um, do little twisties, right? If I have really wild wood, um, I can dip it sideways and the grains are gonna have a different character, right? You can do um, kind of graining like towards the knots by doing this kind of thing or making that kind of heartwood look. And then the surrounding grain, when you look at heartwoods, I actually have a really cool little line drawing of this stuff that I want to scan and get uploaded for y'all too to have as a reference. It's all these different heartwood like right and wrong grain techniques. But one thing when you do shapes like this coming out from around a knot, that's what that is, it's growth in the tree. All of your lines that surround this kind of knot shape, right? If this is my bigger one, say I have a whatever fat knot in here, not making it pretty. Um, my grains that I'm gonna do coming around this want to relate to that angle, but then they straighten out, you know? So that is actually probably pretty hard of an angle. More like this. Not that, not the color. <laughs> you get the idea though. Um, you know, but it's following the contour and same, this side would want to come and relate over here. So oh, it all flows around and relates to each other. Image references are super helpful also remembering those kind of things. Um, so that's the cutout. Using this chip brush is the same generalized techniques. Um, having enough paint but not too much. Uh, it wants to be close to a dry brush but not quite, you know, like so I have paint on here, but it's not tons. Um, same idea. This is going to give me a different look. This is going to be a much more fine lines and more lines. I know for you. Or not. There it is. So this one I have to do much more to 45 to get a nice grain pull out of it. Because the bristles are so stiff. That's not great. So see how where I started, I have a lot more paint deposited. That's something that happens all the time. Um, finessing that with being a little more genteel and airplane-like when I come down. Not doing that, which is what I did. Um, maybe a little less paint on my brush while I finesse that and figure out what that is for my hands. Um, better. The other thing, uh, and this is something that like for big floors, big units, stuff like that, um, if you don't always start on the same side, it helps a lot. Because whenever you have dipped your brush into paint and then you come and apply it, it's gonna have more paint in the bristles at that moment than later when it's deposited some of the paint across the surface. It's pretty logical, right? So always starting here, I'm gonna end up having darker, denser grains just because I'm human and even though I've been doing this for years and I'm good at it, you know, you still do stuff like this. It's just happy, you know, it's part of life. Um, and sometimes when you're trying to get something done fast, you compromise quality. Uh, but yeah, but that's a really good trick of starting your grain pull from different sides, start and stop it in different places to spread out that kind of um, technical issue that can arise. So those are the brush grain looks that you guys will be wanting to work on. Um, and then I will show you how we use the graining tool and the glaze technique. So that's a removal technique to create a vein. This is an application to create a vein. And I'm gonna show you that on a clean board too. The grainer tool. Um, Graining tools are like awesome, and then they're also ripe for problems. Uh, like any other tool, it is how you use it that is going to determine how successful it is. It is not the tool that's going to determine that. It's your technique way. So, one major thing is that these are really good at making repetitive patterns because they are rubber stamps, basically. Um, so, they're very good at making patterns. 
But if you know how to maneuver this thing around and take advantage of what it really is good at, which is making wood grain patterns, um, they actually can create really beautiful wood effects. Um, as you can see though, this is relatively small in scale as far as size. So if I'm doing a stage floor of wood, I am not using this. It is going to take me five years. If I'm doing like a handrail, if I'm doing um, baseboard maybe, a piece of furniture, something in the studio or the main stage space where my audience can get up close to it, that's when I will fold in these guys. I don't, I also will can still do a bit of my hand graining and things like that. I like the combo. I think that really makes it sell well and beautifully. Um, little stair units, little fine things. Um, these are really great for like faux finishing for interiors or people's faces. Again, can be like right up on your fake wood door, stuff like that. So I use these when they serve me. When they don't serve me, I don't use them and it's fine. Um, you can get them in bigger sizes, although they're like a special order type of thing. The hardware store doesn't tend to have the like fatter ones of these around. You will find these in hardware stores and craft stores. Um, so the wood grainer actually has a couple different parts to this rubber um, pad that are useful and usable. One side has these larger rectangular shapes and they're kind of staggered at odd angles. They look like, like really whack jack-o'-lantern teeth or something. Um, so those are big ones. And then on this side it has all these little triangle teeth. These little guys, right? All the little littles. These we can drag and make straight grain, okay? So this one, it's all set up on the handle. If I put this side down, drag this around, it's gonna make a tight, small scale, straight grain. And then I can flip it around, use the other side, the big teeth, it's gonna make me a fat grain. It's a straight grain, it's gonna look real similar to how the chip brush looks, actually. Um, so I'll show you that. Then this rocker part, depending on how I use it, is gonna make me different grain shapes. Um, but yeah, the teeth on each end are one of the main things. And I've worked with people who've been like, oh no, I didn't even realize that part did anything. You know, like, where it's like, it never occurred to me to use the thing on edge. And I was like, yeah. Um, so this is, like I have the little wooden ones where it's like glued on and stuck onto this wood block. And then I have these newer ones that I got where it actually hooks onto these little teeth, you know, and stretches over. I'm gonna show you two different ways of working with these. Um, Cause I actually really prefer to like use this thing in my hand, but that's me. So I'll show you both. Okay. This is done with a glaze, um, and again, it is a apply the glaze and then remove it with the tool. So we're doing a removal technique. Um, those are techniques that you'll see constantly in faux finishing. I don't do a ton of these in theatrical painting, mostly because it's making one thing into two steps of like, I have to do this, and then come and drag the tool through it. So I'd rather just do one thing and move forward. Um, so that's also part of why I don't rely on the wood grain rubber thing too much. So you wanna make sure you get a decent amount down. You're not like spreading it too thin. It needs to be wet for me to work with it. If it's dry, it's not gonna do what I want. It's not gonna be malleable. Um, so do sections that you can manage. So start small. So down there, so I'm coming through. Real similar look to my brush grain, except instead it is letting the lightness or the underpainting show through. So the dark part is gonna be where it has not stayed. And the texture of the underboard is really rough, so that's part of why it's real ugly right there. Um, and I'm not actually pulling it all the way off. So this is not ideal. So you see why I'm not a huge fan <laughs> of this for doing stuff like straight ring. I don't think it's really what it does best. You can do nice groovy things with it. It just takes more finesse and effort, okay? Um, one thing with working with this kind of thing too is like don't start and stop in the middle of your board. <laughs> That's not going to look good. Um, and if you're doing a lot of this, um, you actually need to grab a rag or a paper towel to wipe it out of the tool because it will dry in there and then fill in the cracks. And then you will gum this up and it won't make the same shape. So I'll show you what happens when we use a rocker. And this is what this thing does 
in a really cool way. Yeah, so this thing's rad. And sorry, I don't, the wood one, it slipped on me and wanted to fall off the handle, so I did a rip. That's where that ugliness came in. So you can just straight drag it and get a really beautiful grain, right? I have, I have opaque paint in here. Something with white got onto my brush. Oh, it's the table. That'll do it. I was like, what is making this ugly? I'm grabbing paint I swapped. <laughs> I just don't want to drag all that white into it. It'll make it foggy and not pretty. Woo! Okay. So, you can see how it's starting to fill up. You also want to make sure if you are doing that with anything watery that you're not getting this super damp because it'll dilute the paint out a little. So like tap it off on something dry if you're doing it on a sponge, things like that. Um, so, pretty green, right? Oh, so pretty. If I rock, it's going to close it the way I have this one set up. So basically, as I roll towards the top, it's going to make tighter Vs. As I roll to the bottom, it's going to make more circular ones, I think. So, there we go. So I can rock and make a knot. Yeah. So you see how with some finesse, I can make some really cool stuff start happening. So I like to do, hold on to it this way because I feel like I can control it more. But do you see how just going through and, you know, just getting nicer and more and more finesse ones? But do you see how, like, holding this in my hand, it's actually cleaner where I'm pulling the glaze off compared to here? There's something about how I can get pressure on this with my hand that I find it actually easier for me to do, but it is it does feel more awkward at first. So, don't, don't feel like you have to do that my way. You know, by any means, um, use the rockers if you feel like that's working for you. Um, I'll show you this one on the little rocker. You be careful when you're mounting it on the little rocker things that you're, just don't rip that tiny piece of rubber that holds it all together. Because then I'll have to, you know, when I'm buying a new one, it's fine, but then it's trash because you kind of, unless you're me and you like to hold it in your hand. Um, I'll show you this one on the actual rocking part. Maybe I can get a decent knot in and out. Yeah, ugly. But do you see how if I worked out the issue that I'm having, I think that's because I had goop on here. Do you see how that's nice? These, this one was very oaky. Um, it's pretty nice. You can also always, like I said before, just do a straight drag with this. I get a nice, really nice. I like straight drags out of these, honestly. I think they do them really well. Um, I'm a big fan of that look. Let this one go. Get out of here. Oh, it's so nice, right? That's starting to look really nice. And if I build up a couple more things across that, or maybe a Darker grain with this too. Oh, it's gonna really start looking like a really nice piece of real wood. Last step is the sealer toning pass. And I'll show you that over my um, dry grain so you can see what a toning pass will do over color. Um, and you can check out my other boards and you know the one I'll do showing exactly how I want yours to reveal. Um, you can see what it does hitting over the yellow and the blue. Uh, sponge pad applicator. We're going to use one of these bad boys. Um, Dave, would you mind getting me a lunch tray, please? I forgot that. Thank you. So I need to use a lunch tray with this guy. Thank you. Um, 
to put these on and off. There's a little spring in the middle. Some of them, it's just a little plastic tab that you like push away. There's a little um, ridge on either side of this. And this has a little angle plastic thing it slides into. So when you're putting them on, okay, and you have to just hold this in or it'll catch on that. Um, on this dial, and sometimes you have to like get it to fit onto the track. On this dial, it locks in the center. Some of the handles, I don't know, I feel like I might have gotten rid of them all by now, but um, there's some blue ones that certainly the tabs over here. Uh, but when you buy these, everyone makes them so that they fit on either like brand thing, which is nice. So this is a nice little velour guy. Um, never use soap to clean these, kind of like the rollers. It will take you longer to get the soap out than the use of the soap. Um, always leave these to dry on the counter. You like pull them apart from the handle to wash because this is hollow. And if you're doing a lot of work with these over the course of a day, paint will get in here actually. And then you'll have this like pocket of paint drooling onto your nice clean tool. So pull them apart to wash. Give this little rinse so these springs and things don't get gummed up. Um, and when you're done, uh, these can just get laid on the counter, fluffy side up, always fluffy side up. If you leave it like this, the little hairs will get dented and it will dry like that and stay like that. So always fluffy side up. Um, this is a nice new one, so it doesn't have any big chunks of hair ripped out of it. You can see it's start, the glue started to come undone because it got caught on something and ripped a little. It's still totally usable for me. Um, ones where chunks have gotten taken out of this over wear and tear. Um, it doesn't mean it's like trash, but it definitely means it will make, like if I'm dragging it out and it has holes, that's gonna be a place where it doesn't put as much glaze or paint down and I have a little holiday. Which for wood graining, if I'm doing something really agey, that doesn't hurt me because I'm having places where it's heavier or lighter coated. So that's another reason why I like these. Even if they get a little damaged, they're still pretty useful. You never want to use a really chewed up one to do a high gloss finish that wants to look smooth and pretty. Um, don't use a chewed up one, just get a new one. The new ones will spit a thousand and five hairs out as well. So it's nice to like use it twice and then like have it be like your nice feeler thing. Um, Cause it will spit all those little, all those little white hairs. I like to drop a lot of them when you first work with them. So I'm using my lunch tray and that's because I need to get the paint applied across this whole tool. And um, the lunch trays work really beautifully at that. Uh, the big paint, paint trays, not so much because of all those ridges. So that's why I like the lunch tray. Even though my lunch tray has like a big bubble in the middle of it, I can still move this around to get a nice even coat. Um, I can see like a little pocket deep in here where it hasn't gotten as much. Work it in a little more. That's better, it's not perfect. If you're doing this and you feel like there's way too much glaze on your tool, Come and scrape it on the edge of the lunch tray. It's a really nice way to wipe it out. So I don't have tons, so it's not like dragging a bunch out. And then yeah, really simple and straightforward. You're gonna drag this across your piece. And you can go, you know, back and forth. Um, but I don't stop and start. See how, see how it can make, like I was talking about, about loading your tool and your brush and landing it down. Where I first drop it and don't spread it out, it's gonna leave more color material. So uh, with these, I like to work quickly because the gloss, once it starts tacking and drying, stop touching it because it will fog up and go ugly on you really quickly. Um, so it's one of those things where you need to kind of put it down and then leave it alone. So I need to like get it to spread into this. I'm gonna scrub it right, oh, ugly. As long as I can come in and do this, before it starts tacking up, I'm good, okay? You can also see how initially, like compared to how it looks in the tray and where I first put it down, I can make it look darker or lighter based on how far I'm trying to push the same amount of paint. Um, I can also make it, so if I like spread my paint out more, it's gonna read lighter or it's gonna read less uh, saturation of this brown. Um, I can also make this darker by doing like a second pass of this. This is transparent. It's just gonna build up more of the nice brown color on top of the brown color. I could do that selectively to bring out planks to make you know something look like a deeper, darker brown or a lighter brown. Get that kind of individual characteristic. 
That thing, this is something I love doing on stage floors where I have a wide enough plank floor. So then I can just be like, you get a little warm brown tone and then you get three of them or, you know, and I can just kind of bop my way around the stage randomly. So you could do this with like a red, a brown, you know, anything on its own, same idea. One thing I do really like about working with these grainers is they do kind of make a very subtle and slight linear mark. And, you know, it's real subtle. It's just kind of hard to read right here at all. But like here, I'm seeing more of it. It's nice. It has variety inherently. The tool makes this little drag because it's made out of little hairs. Um, and it's just a nice thing that comes and goes um, without you kind of having to think about it. Does anyone have questions about these things? Yes. Uh huh. Just do straight grain. Basically, I, I like 